Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me, and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again. Today, we have a fascinating topic, which is integrative dermatology with Dr. Julie Greenberg. And we'll look at uh, a general approach for a naturopathic or integrative approach to dermatology. And we'll also dial down a little bit on two of the more common and troubling conditions, which are eczema and psoriasis. Dr. Julie Greenberg is a licensed naturopathic doctor who specializes in integrative dermatology. She's the founder of the Center for Integrative Dermatology, a holistic clinic that approaches skin problems by finding and treating the root cause. Dr. Greenberg holds degrees from Northwestern University, Stanford, and Bastyr University. Dr. Greenberg, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Ben. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. So uh, conventional dermatology approaches skin problems as if they are totally separate from the rest of the body. But the functional medicine or naturopathic or integrative approach looks at the whole person. Um, can you talk about um, how uh, your uh, integrative um, naturopathic approach is different? Yeah, it's. I think it's the main point of why we're having so much trouble in the conventional dermatological world with these chronic dermatological conditions. You know, if you have something acute, if you have a staph infection, you can go to a dermatologist, get a prescription for antibiotics, and the staph infection, like an impetigo, will be cleaned up right away. But if you have something like eczema or psoriasis or acne, these long-term rosacea, chronic skin diseases, I think patients and practitioners know that a lot of people experience kind of a hamster wheel where they go in, they get maybe like a steroid for eczema, the eczema goes down, then they stop the steroid, the eczema comes back, they have to go back, get more steroid, and you kind of get on this hamster wheel where you have to use more and more topical things and then they're not working. And the reason is because a lot of what we've done conventionally is to approach the skin like, oh, it's happening on the skin. So we're going to, we're going to do it from the outside in, and we're just going to suppress symptoms. But in the functional medicine and the naturopathic medicine world, we know the person, the patient sitting in front of you is one human, one body, all systems are connected, mind, body, and spirit, and everything affects the other. And when it comes to these chronic dermatological conditions, there's so much evidence now that the inflammation that's happening, that's causing the things to appear on the skin, they're not happening topically at the skin. I mean, we see them, that's where the end game is, but the source is actually coming from inside, much of it from the gut. And therefore we are not gonna successfully treat patients and get to the root cause just by coming at it from the outside in and trying to suppress symptoms. We, we have to take this functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, whole person approach and connect the systems and address it at every level. The skin is really a reflection of what's going on inside the rest of the body. Absolutely. And, and that's what I tell patients. I think a lot of patients feel that their body has turned on them. Like, why is this happening? Why do I have acne or rosacea? Like, why is my body doing this to me? And I try to reframe it for them. Like, look, your body is always on your side. It's always trying to do the best for you that it can. And when we see these kinds of skin presentations, whether it's in an infant having just terrible eczema, you know, I've seen 90% of babies covered in crusting bloody lesions or, you know, adults who have this chronic nodulocystic acne, it's not because your body has turned on you. It's that it is telling you that it has a problem inside. It cannot resolve and it needs help. And we're going to get in there and help it. Um, and that's all it is. It's just a signal to your, to your body, to yourself. Like we've got big problems inside and we can't handle it. And that's why this is happening. Right. And interestingly, um, most people don't realize this. They, they know about the microbiome inside the digestive tract, 
Um, but the skin has its own microbiome and that's so important to the health of the skin. And we, we might even consider the skin a part of the digestive system. Yeah, it's, I mean, and for me, again, taking this, everything is connected, uh, depending on the disease, like let's take eczema. So I'm thinking about a uh, pathogen staph aureus. It's always basically present in eczema on the skin in, in too large of amounts. It's not a, an infection like we would see in like an abscess or impetigo, but it's an overcolonization. It's causing problems on the skin. It also colonizes the nose. And usually when we gut test, it's overgrown in the GI tract. So again, there's this concept that we can't just pay attention to one thing. And the skin microbiome is critical, of course, to what's happening on the skin, but we have to treat the nasal colonization or the staff will keep coming back. And we have to treat the gut colonization because you're, you're basically, if you have leaky gut, then leaching staph aureus into the bloodstream as well. And um, yeah, it's critical. The, the skin microbiome, the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome are distinctly different. They look very different, but they are all absolutely interrelated and absolutely when it comes to dermatological disease. And you mentioned leaky gut and, and we, most of us who deal with patients with uh, gut problems and people do have chronic gut problems, I'm sure have heard this term a lot, is that leaky gut is often common that the intestinal mucosal barrier is broken down, allowing toxins and, and large proteins to get in, which cause immune problems, et cetera. Um, but often people who have leaky gut um, often have damage to the uh, barrier in the skin. So uh, leaky gut often results in leaky skin. Yeah, we, and we see both. Um, you know, anytime the skin barrier gets compromised, um, you're going to get leaky skin. And there's an interesting aspect of leaky skin as it pertains to eczema, because we know that for infants and, and babies, that early skin barrier disruptions can lead to food allergies and asthma. And so the same idea that we have like, oh, you know, I think most of your listeners know what leaky gut is and that things are leaking through uh, the intestinal lining, getting into the bloodstream and causing an immune response. The same thing can happen topically with leaky skin. And it's actually quite dangerous in infants because their immune system is learning what in the environment is okay and what is not. And if their first uh, introduction to like a pollen or a food protein comes through the skin, that's an inappropriate presentation to their immune system. And they can get primed in a way that's, that's not good. And it can lead to food allergies and asthma. And um, we know this, not just statistically, like because infants who have, or babies with skin barrier disruptions are six times more likely to develop food allergies and I do mean allergies, IgE, not just IgG, IgA. Uh, but they've done studies in mice where they've actually first created eczema on the backs of mice. And then they've, they, these, these uh, mice had no problem with eggs before, no antibodies. They then taped um, gauze filled with ovalbumin or egg white protein in cycles to their backs. And they created IgE and IgG antibodies and full-blown um, egg allergies in this mice where they never had them before. So we know it happens uh, because of the numbers, but they can actually recreate it in the lab. You give the rat, the, the mouse eczema, and then you can induce a full-blown food allergy. So yeah, it's the leaky skin is a huge issue. And um, it's something particularly in my eczema babies I talk to parents about like, we really wanna to try to clean up the skin barrier as quickly as possible because for them, it's a whole different issue than somebody who's an adult who has skin barrier disruptions. And of course, it's also a reason why you wanna use some topical treatment to treat the skin, as well as treating the inside underlying root causes of the skin condition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know with eczema, we want to keep the skin moisturized. We want to try to help that barrier. Um, I focus a lot on skin pH. Um, many people, I think we know the stomach is supposed to be very acidic. The blood is very tightly regulated at 7.4. If, if the blood pH gets much off of 7.4, you know, we, we can die. But people don't realize that the skin has its own pH that's absolutely critical. And many people, I ask every patient, um, now that I'm doing telemedicine, we do a screen share and there's a slide on pH. 
And I, we go through the scale, what's acidic, what's alkaline. And I have them just guess, where do you think the skin pH should be? And I think for just to feel safe, most of my patients guess seven, like neutral water, blood, which is a reasonable guess. But the truth is it's acidic. The skin needs to be acidic to function properly, which is about anywhere from four to five, 5.5. And, um, so I definitely do things to help bring that skin pH back down again, to protect it, because we know that in basically every dermatological disease that the skin barrier has become more alkaline. And so it's not at four to five, it's, it's up higher at six or seven. And that leaves you susceptible to pathogens. So staph aureus, for example, it wants 7.5. But if you name any pathogen, whether it's like a herpes virus, malassezia or candida yeast or bacteria, all of those pathogens want a more alkaline skin environment so that it can thrive and so that our natural defenses can't attack it. So if we can do things topically to pull that skin pH back down and internally, there's, there's supplements I use like L-histidine to do that. Um, we can definitely improve the skin barrier and, and start to see you know, improvements on whatever the skin disease is. Yeah, I, I find that interesting. Same thing for the importance of hydrochloric acid to help keep the bacteria from overgrowing in the small intestine. And, and I think uh, there's been this over um, emphasis in health enthusiasts about having uh, an alkaline um, system about uh, it, it being acidic is bad, being acidic causes disease, causes cancer, causes all this stuff. So the answer is to drink alkaline water and to eat this alkaline diet. And, um, you know, there's a lot of problems with that. And especially when it comes to the skin, trying to alkalinize your skin. And um, so I know I talked to Jennifer Fugo about, um, she's a big um, opponent to using coconut oil on the skin, um, which a lot of people feel is good, um, but it's uh, very alkalinizing. And so it ruins the acidic pH of the skin. Yeah, Jen, Jen and I have had discussions about coconut oil. I know she's not a fan. I'm not a fan of people using straight coconut oil day after day as their moisturizer because it can dry out the skin. Um, the, I mean, with the, the things that I do to make the skin more acidic are before the oils, the, the more of the water-based products, things like aloe vera gel, apple cider vinegar, hydrosols, um, all the water-based products are, have this more acidic pH. The oils, technically an oil doesn't have a pH because a pH scale is based on water and, and strict oils don't have it. So it gets a little more complicated when we're talking about something like coconut oil. I use coconut oil to spot treat um, tough skin problems, but I only use it to spot treat. And I only use it when we do essential oil blends to kill off things like staph aureus on the skin or malassezia or something like that. Um, so I, I do think it gets overused and, and I don't like people to use it as a general moisturizer. But, sure. but for therapeutic purposes, coconut oil has this uh, antimicrobial benefit, right? It does. And there's plenty of studies that show that use of coconut oil versus let's say mineral oil or even olive oil in um, eczema patients, it, it's a lot more effective at um, lowering staph. So I do think there is a time and a place for coconut oil, but it's not kind of the panacea that you know, sometimes if you look at YouTube, it's like, you can use coconut oil for everything. You can use it for a lot, but I wouldn't use it as your main moisturizer. Yeah, it's funny how um, Google was kind of the bane of our existence for a while. Everybody's saying, oh, I just Googled it. And now everybody's coming in saying, oh, I just watched a YouTube video and uh, we're having that with chiropractic. Aren't you going to do that adjustment? Uh, what about the one where you pull the towel and pull on my head? I saw <laughs> that on YouTube. That fixed everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... It's kind of interesting. Um, so um, in, in terms of uh, dermatological conditions, um, uh, the, you, you, we were talking a little bit about the gut bacteria, and I, I know that you find it super important to look at the gut as a way to analyze um, uh, what's going on underneath. So, um, you know, why is gut health so important? And then what tests do you like to do to analyze gut health for patients with skin conditions? 
Yeah. So for me, it really is critical to look at the gut so that I can get to the root cause of what's driving the skin disease. There are, is a lot of research out there. It's not pulled together into a cohesive body, but once you start going looking for it, you can do research for each like different type of dermatological disease like eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, on and on. And you will find studies and research that show that the gut of patients with chronic dermatological disease is not the same as normal healthy controls. They have too little good uh, gut bacteria, too much bad bacteria. Often they have candida overgrowth or other, you know, problems like protozoa. Um, and it, it's, you know, I think as integrative practitioners, it actually makes sense. You know, 80% of our immune system is, is coming from the gut. And obviously, you know, when it's disrupted, we get all sorts of problems. So it can lead to, you know, diabetes, it can lead to heart problems. Um, just the, the inflammation through the system is going to cause problems. Now, specifically why, you know, certain people are going to get psoriasis versus rosacea, we haven't really untangled that. We know that there are some element of genetic components to that, but the important thing is we know, I know when my patient is sitting in front of me, something is wrong with their gut, even with acne. It, it doesn't matter what they're presenting with. Something is wrong with the gut. And, and I need to get in there and try to figure out what it is. For different conditions, I kind of have different suspects at the top of mind. So for rosacea, for example, there's a lot of research that shows SIBO and H. pylori are at play. Now that's not 100%. So I still have to go test them and figure out what exactly is going wrong. And I have two tests that I like to run on every patient who can afford it. Because then of course, unfortunately, they usually aren't covered by insurance. One is a stool test. I, I want to look at what is in the colon? How many, what are the strains of good bacteria? What are the strains of bad bacteria? How many of each? Where is the problem? Is it like an enormous pseudomonas overgrowth? I see a lot of psoriasis and psoriatic um, related diseases. There's, there's a lot of pseudomonas overgrowth that, that tends to trigger it. It's high in LPS or endotoxins. Um, with acne, there's a lot of correlation to H. pylori. With eczema, of course, there's a big um, staph aureus component. With psoriasis, there's a big strep component. Um, strep is the, the number one environmental trigger that we know that can cause psoriasis. So I use the stool test and also for their digestive health. To your point, um, the stool test I use has H. pylori. I have to know what's the H. pylori situation in their stomach and is their stomach acidic enough? Because if it's not acidic enough, then I'm gonna see overgrowth of all the commensals, overgrowth of all the dysbiotic and autoimmune ones. And I have to treat the H. pylori since it's at the top of the stream. You know, if, we, if I just go in and treat the overgrowth, but I haven't corrected the H. pylori and stomach acid problem, we're going to have this problem and this discussion, you know, in, in a month and we're going to keep having it. So that's really critical. And then the other test that I like is an oat or an organic acid test, which is a urine test. And that one I use because um, the stool tests don't always pick up candida because candida tends to overgrow in the small intestine. So there's plenty of times where it won't come out on the stool test, but it does come out on the oat. And I also, the oat that I use tests for fusarium and aspergillus. So I need to know not only is there a yeast or a candida problem, is there a bigger mold problem? And then that might lead us to look at mycotoxins. Which, um, which oat test do you like? I personally like Great Plains Oat, and I use the um, GI Map, which I know you've had them on, so I, I work with them, and um, that's the stool test that I prefer. Is the one that I just find most actionable, um, and so together, I love both of those tests. And once I get those labs back, it's like suddenly this this curtain opens and everything is revealed, and I see why exactly what's happening on their skin is happening. And we just go in and we start to address the things one by one, because it's usually multiple things happening. Certain diseases, like once we get to alopecia areata and it's, you know, we're attacking hair follicles and it's full-blown autoimmune, I usually see that there is a huge amount of gut dysbiosis that needs to be addressed and usually also a toxic element that needs to be addressed. But I can always start with those two gut tests and start to see great improvement you know, usually within the first month, we, we come back for our visit and it's like, yeah, things are definitely getting better, much better, you know, baby sleeping through the night, uh, you know, the rash is gone X percent, like sometimes it's just gone, but I have to tell them like, we still have to treat all this stuff or it's going to come back. And 
And so patients are usually just thrilled with it. They finally have answers. They finally are getting solutions and they're off of this kind of hamster wheel of conventional medicine where it's like, well, I didn't know what else to use on my baby besides steroids. So that's what we were using, but I knew it wasn't right. And that's why I was looking for something else. So yeah, it's really uh, fulfilling. So you mentioned H. pylori and I, I know I probably should stay on topic and not jump down a rabbit hole, but I love rabbit holes. Um, so recently we've had, an, I've had a number of discussions with different practitioners and uh, there's a lot of controversy about H. pylori. Um, should we even treat H. pylori? H. pylori is a commensal. I, I know Dr. Stephen Sandberg Lewis said, for the most part, you, you usually don't want to treat H. pylori. It's a commensal. Uh, other gut experts have said, absolutely, it's crucial. Um, some people feel that only if there are certain um, virulence factors should the H. pylori really be treated. Um, there's controversy about whether H. pylori is associated with hyper or hypochlorhydria. So um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but maybe you could uh, just give your take on H. pylori. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I have that issue with H. pylori and then with some of the protozoa. Right, yes, like blastosis yes. is hominous. Right, we'll, we, we'll, we had that whole discussion. I know, and so and so it's it's kind of a similar issue, but I'll, I'll stick with the H. pylori for yeah. now. Um, yeah, it for me, it definitely depends. Um, you know, I don't think we've fully unraveled the H. pylori story. We know that it, it it can be present and not cause problems, and it can cause problems. For me, that's part of why I'm looking at the stool test in whole. I want to see how much H. pylori is present. Um, I want to see if there's virulence factors. And then as I start to look down the stool test, that's where I start to see, is there overgrowth of the normal bacteria? Is there overgrowth of the dysbiotic and autoimmune, potential autoimmune bacteria? Because if I see, um, let's say I see H. pylori in like moderate amounts with no virulence factors, but then it, the stool test just starts lighting up. Like all of the normal bacteria are high. All of the dysbiotic and autoimmune are high. And then I, you know, then when I get to the intestinal health section, you know, they're maybe low on pink, on elastase and they're, the steatocrit is high. I know they're not digesting their food properly then absolutely for me, H. pylori is a problem and I need to treat it. You know, if the H. pylori is moderately low, the normal is not overgrown. And, you know, there's not a lot of huge overgrowth of, you know, the other kind of dysbiotic bacteria and the elastase is good and they're digesting their fat, you know, then I probably won't choose to go after H. pylori or I'll kind of put it in the back of my, like, if I think H. pylori is a problem, it's one of the first things I go after because as we talked about, it's upstream but if it's kind of on the fence and I'm like, well, I'm not entirely sure, I might start with other things. And if I'm not getting the response that I need, then I might add like digestive enzymes. See, did that make a difference? Did, did adding a little hydrochloric acid help things? And then maybe I will go back and go after the, pylor the H. pylori. But it is definitely on my radar. And I, I don't think it's like an innocent bystander because and, and in older patients, we know that already the stomach acid is, you know, not as acidic. And so is it a 74 year old patient with alopecia areata with H. pylori? Now I'm getting more concerned about that H. pylori than I would in a 21 year old. So because so. you're thinking uh, one of the issues is H. pylori tends to be associated with hypo, low hydrochloric acid secretion, yes. even though I, we first learned about H. pylori as a cause of ulcers from hyperchlorhydria. Yeah, but I have to say that for me, for, for the derm stuff that I deal with, really almost 100% of the time, the H. pylori is causing hypochlorhydria. The stomach acid is too low. Um, I look for specific strains of oral bacteria that are high. So staph and strep, Prevotella and, and fusobacteria are usually coming from you know, skin and oral. And if those are overgrown, I know they're not dying in the stomach acid. So yeah, for me, I, it, it it is so rare that I'm concerned with hyperchlorhydria. It's almost always hypochlorhydria. What's your What's your favorite strategy for reducing H. pylori? Um, I like pylorosol by orthomolecular, um, and I you know I'll use masticum and DGL and um, glutashield okay. and, and stuff like that. That's that's how I tend to go after it. I'm. Okay. 
I'm licensed in California, Oregon, and Washington. And with our fun naturopathic licensing by state, I have different scope of practice. So in Oregon and Washington, I can prescribe just about anything because it's physician level, but in California, we're doctor level. So I've just in my training and I, you know, I mostly turn to herbals first unless, unless there's like a skin infection and you need an antibiotic or something, but I tend to mostly use herbs to treat um, the gut dysbiosis. In have, all you, have you prescribed mastic gum for kids? Um, yeah, mastic gum and DGL, um, you know, just kind of using Clark's rule and they're pretty safe and um, it's, it's helpful. You know, usually they taste pretty good and so they'll take it. Oh, really? The mastic well, the, gum? The DGL, okay. not the mastic oh, gum. But okay. The, the mastic gum has a nasty smell too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's other stuff I use, like I use butyric acid on I mean, kids, which smells kind of poopy too. So a lot of the stuff, I feel like you kind of have to hide it in other things, but right. you know. Okay. So let's drill down a little bit on eczema, which is, you, you, we've just been talking about kids and eczema is also known as atopic dermatitis. And this is extremely common in children. And uh, I have a feeling it may be more common in adults and com commonly uh, recognized, but. Yeah, it's, it's a little hard in adults. I think a rash is like, when, whenever we see a rash, we call it eczema, right? And so there's, in my mind, there's like the infant eczema, that's true eczema, that's this TH2 driven pathway. There's other, there's other immune pathways in eczema that we know, like TH1, TH17, TH22, but it's, it's a heavy TH2 driven pathway. Okay. When an adult comes to me and they are now having rashes for the first time, for me, that's not eczema. Um, usually that's being driven by something else. It can be like yeast overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth, but it's not, it's not classic eczema as I think about it. It's more of a dermatitis, but in the kids and the babies who come to me and you know, they're, that's eczema. So. Okay. So, um, you, you mentioned that it's often associated with staph infection. Or yeah. And I think infection confuses people. So I'll say it is an infection, but it's, it's easier for people to understand if we say colonization. So the staff will get on the skin. What happens in a lot of these babies is they're deficient in something called filaggrin. Now, I feel like most of us as doctors haven't heard of filaggrin, but it's really important. It's the master, um, it's, a, it's a protein in the skin and we call it the master protein. Uh, regulator of the skin barrier. And filaggrin is something that we use then to create a natural moisturizing factor. So we break down the filaggrin into its amino acids. It's very high in um, L-glutamine and L-histidine. And then we create acids out of it and we build natural moisturizing factor. That natural moisturizing factor controls the pH of our skin, which we talked about is so critical. And it really is, is the critical thing to whether or not you have healthy skin because it keeps the moisture in and if you dry out the stratum corneum, like 20 to 30% of it should be natural moisturizing factors. So this is a big deal in the, the skin. And a lot of kids have filaggrin gene mutations where they're just not producing enough filaggrin and therefore not producing enough natural moisturizing factor. Um, and so that's something that needs to be addressed, especially in kind of the early days for them to try to, um, help them with the skin barrier. And so the interesting thing is I think we think of skin barrier, well, let's put something on it, which is true. We know that um, putting emollients and moisturizers on babies with eczema is helpful, um, but there's a very interesting amino acid called L-histidine, which filaggrin used to be called histidine rich protein because it was so abundant in it. And um, there's good evidence. There's a, a good study on humans that show that dosing four grams a day in adults um, for one to three months uh, really improved their skin barrier. They had reductions in their eczema about 30%. And uh, the effect was the same as about a mid potency topical steroid, but with no negative side effects. And I use L-histidine widely um, in my infant, everybody from my infant to my adult patients, because the nasty thing about staph is there's 11 different ways that we know of that it attacks the skin and creates just a horrible situation for the person, but a great situation for staph. And it is able to more easily kill filaggrin deficient cells. 
So we need to build up that filaggrin in anybody who's got staph colonization on their skin and, and that protects them from the inside out. And then of course, we're also doing things topically to address the staph overgrowth and, and nasally, as I said, we, we have to address the colonization in the nose or it just keeps coming back. Give us some specific um, treatments for staph. So for, for adults, I use the four grams a day of L-histidine and, and then for infants or smaller people, I use Clark's uh, dosing. Um, and I usually keep them on a full dose for like two to three months. And then I start to ramp down um, because we don't have any long-term studies of L-histidine. So I don't keep them on long-term. Topically, I use uh, lots of things to get that acidic pH. Staph aureus hates acidic pH. It wants 7.5. And so if the skin can tolerate it, um, apple cider vinegar diluted 50-50 with water or hydrosol is great. Now at the beginning, that might be very stingy to really compromise skin. So hydrosols are wonderful. <clears throat> hydrosols are gentle, um, yet powerful, and they're acidic. What is a hydrosol? Yeah. So, you know, essential oils, I feel like everyone knows what an essential oil is and they've right. taken over and it worries me, but people create their own, you know, essential oil stuff at home, which is actually quite dangerous because essential oils are very potent things. And hydrosol is a part of the process of making an essential oil. So let's say we want to make rosemary essential oil. You're going to take hundreds of pounds of plant material of the rosemary. You're going to put it in like a copper distiller with water. You heat it up and boil that plant material with the water. And then it's going to evaporate and cool in a secondary receptacle. And water evaporates and the volatile oils evaporate. So what we collect in the second unit on the top, the floating top quote unquote, oily layer is the essential oil. And underneath it is water and that is the hydrosol. So they siphon off this top floating layer and they put it into essential oil bottles. But that water that gets left behind is really a beautiful substance. It's infused with a lot of the plant properties. So the antimicrobial aspects, and I love rosemary hydrosol. It's got um, good antibacterial and antifungal action but it's very gentle. So you can use it on infants. You can use it on pets. Um, essential oils are toxic to cats. So you can kill your cat using essential oils. And I don't like using them on infants because they're just too concentrated and we absorb them into our skin. And it's, it's a lot for a baby. Um, but hydrosols oh, are totally would be a great safe. name for the podcast. How not to kill your cat. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, people don't know. It's like, oh, essential oils, we're going to diffuse them day and night and close the windows and the doors. And, and honestly, if your cat is in there is really they, they don't they can't detoxify it and it's toxic to them. So but um, yeah, but I essential oils is a whole different podcast on how to use them responsibly, but I don't like to use them on infants and babies if I can help it. But hydrosols, and I use hydrosols every day as part of a beauty regimen um, because not only is acidic skin, healthy skin in terms of not having eczema, but our skin um, will age slower. So you will have less wrinkles and dark spots um, if you keep your skin acidic. So I use aloe vera gel, rosemary hydrosol, and then a, a serum blend that I make every day to try to keep the wrinkles away. <laughs> cool. Um, so I, I noticed from uh, reading some of your literature that eating dairy is often a trigger for eczema. Yeah, there's lots of different foods that tend to make eczema flare. Um, the, the problem a lot comes from infants who maybe can't be best breastfed or they're being supplemented with co cow and goat's milk. And um, in infants who have bad eczema and cradle cap, once I see cradle cap, then I know that they've pretty much got an overgrowth of candida in their gut because cradle cap is a yeast on the scalp called malassezia. And we all have malassezia, it's, it's a normal, it's a commensal again, but what happens with cradle cap or even dandruff in adults is we have this malassezia on our scalp, it's eating our sebum, we think on some level it probably starts to overgrow, but what really goes wrong is instead of looking at it as a commensal, which the body should be doing, suddenly the body is producing an inflammatory response to it. And I see clinically and in my tests, they always have candida overgrowth. And I think that internally they're starting to produce antibodies against the candida, which is a yeast. And um, 
then the body, I think, misfires and sees the malassezia yeast and thinks, oh, well, wait, we've got, we've got this problem with candida yeast in the gut and we're producing antibodies to that. And this malassezia yeast looks a lot like it. <clears throat> so let's attack it too. And you get that inflammatory cradle cap. And every time when these babies are on cow or goat's milk, there's something about it with the candida overgrowth. Usually we take the cow and goat's milk away and their skin gets dramatically improved. So sometimes, I don't know why the parents fight me on it. We have to find other um, you know, plant-based formulas and it's hard, but they're out there. But these kids don't do well with cow and goat milk. And I, I just have to talk to the parents and say, you know, your baby is not a baby cow. It's not a baby goat. <laughs> so, you know, I know you want to give them milk from a mammal, but it's, it's just not working. And every time we pull that other mammalian milk source and usually the skin gets better. So not, not for human milk, but you know, the other milk sources. And, and then, you know, they get the negotiation. How about camel's milk, How about donkey milk? Like, no, all mammalian milk is out unless it's you, unless it's human. Um, you know, we have to cut it out and it's just every time it gets better. Do you ever do testing for milk allergies or milk sensitivities? I don't because I don't want to stick an infant and the easiest thing is just to pull it and see if it gets better. And there's, there's plenty of supplements for formulas that we can use to get them through that stage where they, they still need milk. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I just don't like sticking babies. So yeah. generally yeah. not. So I understand low vitamin D is a risk factor for eczema as it is for almost everything. Yeah. I think D is one of those things where, you know, we see the tests and the, the D is low, is associated to be low with the conditions, but then we can't always show that supplementing improves the conditions. But I still think giving D, it's, it's like giving probiotics. I think it's one of those things that can't hurt. I will say the only, the only condition where I don't supplement with D is rosacea because rosacea, there's something happening with um, an antimicrobial peptide on the skin called cathelicidin. And we know that it actually gets exacerbated by vitamin D. So that's the one condition where I don't supplement with D, but everybody else, you know, I feel pretty good supplementing with D because we're all deficient and um, it, it might help and it's not going to hurt. And I understand there's a number of topicals for uh, eczema as there is for many of these conditions. And one of them is topical B12. Yeah, there's um, Dr. Peter Leo is an integrative dermatologist and he talks a lot about pink cream. Um, so the B12 is kind of anti-inflammatory and it will, it, it comes in as a red or pink powder. So if you're using that ointment, it is going to be pink and you can get it compounded in a pharmacy and it helps a little bit with inflammation. Um, it's not, it's not one that I tend to use um, just because again, I'm, I'm trying it feels it's more symptomatic. It's not that the person is deficient in B12 on the skin, but it, it certainly can help with the eczema. So I'm, I'm going at things from a different perspective, but it is popular and it, it does help improve the skin topically. It seems to be anti-inflammatory. So let's touch on psoriasis a little bit. Um, so how have, uh, how has thinking uh, on psoriasis changed uh, as well as treatments? I know we think of psoriasis as a systemic autoimmune condition. Yeah, that's one of the first changes. I mean, we really used to think of psoriasis as, oh, look at what's happening on the skin. That's a dermatological disease. This person has a skin disease. And then, you know, over the past few decades, it's really evolved into understanding. Um, and we used to think it was mostly a Th1 uh, mediated uh, inflammatory disease. Then we discovered Th17 and Th22 is um, another pathway that's highly tied in with mucosal inflammation. So now we know that um, Psoriasis is a heavily TH17 mediated disease with, with a dash of TH22 and TH1. There's a lot going well, on. What does that really mean though? How, how does that help us, this TH? It, it helps us, well, it helps the pharmaceutical industry because they're going for okay. suppressive effects, right? Okay. So they're, they are going for, they, they have everything now in the psoriatic world is an anti, an anti um, IL-17 and anti IL-23. So those are functions of TH-17. Yeah, most for, for us as functional medicine are docs, blocking agents, yeah. Right, although I will say that, you know, I do, I do do research and use certain herbs. Like there's an herb, Scutellaria bicolensis, which is Chinese skull cap. And in, Research study after research study, it has been shown to um, 
decreased TH17 and IL-17 and increased Treg and IL-10. So there is a way that we can use that information, you know, herbally, but. Um, you know, also yeah, something mean, helpful to reduce cytokine storm. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so, psoriasis is, we know it's, it is a inflammatory, a systemic problem. We call it an autoimmune disease, but the interesting thing is we haven't found what that piece is. And the more research I do on it, the more I actually am not sure that it is autoimmune, not in the same way of like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where we can test for antibodies against, you know, thyroid. We, we have never found that for psoriasis. And the more research I do and the more I treat psoriasis as I really think it's just a response to massive overgrowth of, um, of a lot of bacteria. So earlier I talked about strep. Strep is a huge, huge trigger for psoriasis. And I see other um, kind of similarities like pseudomonas seems to be a big driver of it, but it's just massive gut dysbiosis, massive leaky gut. It gets into the bloodstream. It gets into the skin plaques. And when we test the plaques, we find like DNA of gut microbial origin, um, we just, we find like all of these connections to what is happening in the gut. It gets into the bloodstream and it lodges in the skin. And there is a genetic component to psoriasis. And again, you know, why somebody is getting psoriasis as opposed to, you know, another disease, we don't fully have the answer for that, but it's massive gut dysbiosis. And once we start to clean that up, then it, it really starts to resolve. And, and with psoriasis, again, we, you know, talk about compromised skin barrier. I'm always thinking about secondary skin infection. So a lot of times there is a secondary staph aureus infection on top of psoriasis, and there can also be malassezia or candida yeast infections on the psoriasis. And so we definitely want to treat those as well, if that's a factor, because the psoriasis is only going to get so much better while it's still got, you know, a colonization and an overgrowth of pathogens on the skin. I think I, I read in one of those um, courses that strep is often associated with psoriasis as well. Yeah, it's the number one most associated environmental trigger. So we know that people who have a case of strep throat, that can trigger an outbreak of particularly of gutate psoriasis. Um, but the what strep is, is- gutate psoriasis? Yeah, so there's several, there's different types of psoriasis. So there's the most common and the one that's most well known is plaque psoriasis. And those are the big patches that you would see, you know, typically on the outside of the elbows or the knees. Um, gutate psoriasis are, are kind of spots or teardrop psoriasis that happen all over. Um, there's inverse psoriasis, which happens in the intertriginous zones or the folds. So women will get it like below the breasts, um, in the armpits, in the groin. Um, so there's, there's different types of psoriasis, but um, yeah, strep is associated with all of them. When I do gut testing, I often see strep overgrowth um, in the gut. And when they do antibody testing, pretty much everyone with psoriasis has titers or some sort of response to strep, whether they knew that they had it or not. And sometimes in my um, psoriasis patients, I'll treat their throat with, with antimicrobial throat sprays because strep tends to hide and colonize the tonsils and um, it can form biofilms that it can be hard to get to. And so this is another instance of like with eczema, we have to treat the staph on the skin, in the nose and in the gut. With psoriasis, we have to treat the strep, the strep in this case, in the um, tonsils and uh, in the gut as well. How do you, how do you treat the strep in the tonsils? And then going back to the last discussion, how do you treat the staph in the nose? So the staph in the nose, um, I use various nasal sprays um, and there's a lot of different options. And, and I don't do this in infants or children because it's just torture. So for this, I, I just have the parents to kind of try to wipe stuff into the nose. But um, for older kids and adults, it's nasal spray. And um, I like colloidal silver spray. There's colloidal silver sprays with herbs in it. There's propolis spray. You can take a saline spray and make an essential oil blend and shake it vigorously and spray. So there's a lot of different options um, for the nasal treatment, but my go-to is like a colloidal silver with, with herbs. Um, is there a particular product? Yeah, there's an ACS nasal spray um, that is colloidal silver with like echinacea and some herbs. And I like that one. Um, so that's kind of one of my standards. And then for the strep, so there aren't studies and we don't know for sure if it's helping, but I like biocide and throat spray. Um, 
I figure, you know, it's interesting. They do all these studies with um, psoriasis patients where they remove their tonsils and they get dramatically better. And it is because they're basically removing the staph. That's pretty dramatic to remove somebody's tonsils, right? But but time and time again, I mean, they'll, you have these small studies, like 15 people, and they removed all their tonsils, and like 13 of them, the psoriasis improved. So it, there's significant numbers that we know that this strep colonization is causing problems, but, you know, a lower intervention seems to be <laughs> using. Well, we, you know, in this spray. society, we remove tonsils all the time. It's not that big a deal. You know, I know we remove tonsils, we remove uteruses. It's like, oh, appendixes. It's like, well, we don't need it. Just cut it extra out. parts. You really need it. Exactly. You know? <laughs> so, you know, I feel like let's try a throat spray before we <laughs> remove the tonsils and see. If oh, that my helps. God. That's so dramatic. You're going to take some herbs. Yeah, exactly. No, let's do surgery. Um, how can bile, what's the connection with bile acids and psoriasis? Yeah, so bile is really interesting. I think most of us in the functional medicine world think of bile as like, okay, we need bile to emulsify fats and digest the food. And, right. you know, if we saw a high steatic By the liver and stored in the gallbladder and we yeah. the intestines. Exactly. And it's like, okay, yeah, you know, that's the function of bile is to emulsify fats. And if we see Except I that see people have had their gallbladder removed too. Well, it's, now right, yes. have, you know, just exactly. Now it's a problem, you know, get rid of it. Yep. That's one of those, like chop it off. Um, <laughs> but um, bile is interesting in that it's actually hugely antibacterial and antimicrobial. And um, there are uh, definitely case studies that have been done trying to treat psoriasis just by using like bile acids, just by trying to um, make sure that when someone is eating, that there's enough bile to kill the bacteria that's part of the leaky gut. And um, so when you say bile improves. acids, do you mean things like ox bile or you mean uh, drugs like cholestyramine? So again, I, I tend to use more herbal protocol. So I use ox bile, either ox bile by itself or um, what I usually like are there's, I like enzymes that have hydrochloric acid, a pancreatic enzymes and bile salts. So I, I tend to use- Is there a particular product that you like? Yeah, I, I really like Duozyme by Karuna. Um, that's kind of a go-to. I'm um, not familiar with that one. We usually use uh, Digestzymes from Designs. But that one, I don't- it, the, I don't know if it has hydrochloric acid and bile salts. It it's does. hard to find that. It has a little Integrate, oh, Okay. Panplex 2 um, by Integrative Therapeutics also has all three. Okay. So a lot of them will have just pancreatic or just HDL and pancreatic. But yeah, I, I look for the trio. Um, so I'm usually just giving all three together. Yeah. Um, and yeah, bile does an amazing job at um, killing bacteria as you're eating and as there's a leaky gut, we definitely want to kill off that bacteria. What about better. herbal bitters to stimulate bile? Yeah, you can use that too. It's obviously a higher intervention to give the ox bile. Um, and for kids, I have to use um, the more of the herbal bitters because anybody who can't swallow a pill, they can't take ox bile. I, I have tried, I, you know, and as a naturopathic doctor, I feel like I'm pretty immune to like smells and tastes of things like andrographis, like isn't even that bitter to me, you know, but I tried, you know, oh, could, is it possible to ask a patient to take the ox bile and open up the cap? And it was so vile. I, I literally almost vomited. And I was like, this is going to be like, there's no way to hide this. Like of all the things I ask patients to do, there's no possible way to ask them to do this. So yeah. in somebody who can't swallow a capsule, it's, it's going to have to be bitters. There's just, if, if any of your listeners have found a way to get ox bile in somebody not in a capsule, please contact me. Cause it's, it is appalling. It's just horrific. So I know this is a topical vitamin D that is sometimes used for psoriasis. Yeah. Again, you know, it's, um, it's, it is used. It can be somewhat helpful for me. Again, it's not a root cause. I'm not addressing a top, you know, a pathogen overgrowth with it and I'm not addressing kind of other things. So I, I tend topicals not Topicals that you like to use for psoriasis. I, I, so for me, it's somewhat similar in terms of addressing the skin pH that the psoriatic skin pH is definitely alkaline. I'm going to pull it back down to acidity and try to improve the barrier. There is a particular herb that is very well researched for psoriasis called indigo naturalis. 
Um, so there are, um, you know, topical emollients uh, like body butters and stuff that are made with indigo naturalis that can be helpful. Indigo naturalis has been shown to decrease IL-17. Um, so then again, knowing the cytokine pathways can be helpful for our herbs. Um, it is blue is the name indigo would um, indicate. So depending on if they're making their own, it can stain things. So you should warn them. Um, but you know, there are a couple products out there with the indigo that aren't quite as stainy, but that's, that's a well-known Chinese herb um, that's used topically with pretty good success in psoriasis because we think it's decreasing the IL-17 in the skin. I, I, I noticed in one of your articles, you mentioned that when applying things to the skin that you don't like, I, I'm not really familiar with, um, you know, skin creams and stuff. I personally don't put anything on my skin, but uh, my wife certainly does. And uh, I, I, I know that there's a, a, one of the products contains oils along with water-based stuff sort of mixed together. And you don't like that. You like doing them separately. Yeah. I get on my little soap box rant about lotion. I really hate lotion. lotion. Okay. And I don't know why it's like so prevalent in our society, but here's the problem with lotion. Get all up together and just do one thing. I know it's, yeah. I mean, I guess it's the convenience, but the problem with mixing it up is this fundamentally a lotion is, is oil and water together. Well, we know from fifth grade science class, when you pour oil and water together, they don't mix, they float on top of each other. Well, that would make for a horrible product, right? So what the chemical, what the product company needs to do is add a chemical called an emulsifier. An emulsifier will smash together at the molecular level, the oil and water and keep it together. Well, now that we have water in this product, we must have a preservative. You have to, or it's not gonna be shelf stable and it's gonna be overrun with bacteria and fungus very quickly. So anytime you buy a lotion, what you're buying is oil, water, emulsifier, and preservative. Those are the bulk of what's in there. And a lot of the oils that are used in, in classic lotions are mineral-based or petroleum-based, which are not good for the skin either. And a lot of the things that, you know, like parabens or endocrine disruptors, you know, those are in there as emulsifiers and preservatives. So a lot of the products that now we know cause huge problems for people fall into the emulsifier and preservative camp. So for me, it's like, well, why would we do that? Let's just keep our water-based products separate from our oil-based products. We don't need emulsifier. We don't need preservative. And now we can put 100% good things on the skin just by keeping them in separate bottles. Like how hard is that really? So, so what does that mean? Like, so that means like that using things. So my water-based products are the things like the aloe and the hydrosol. Those stay in separate bottles and those you spray on the hydrosol you let it dry for 30 to 60 seconds. Then you apply the aloe vera gel. You let that dry for 30 to 60 seconds. And then you're gonna apply your body, your body butter or your you know, facial serum separately. We've kept all the products separate. We have not mixed the oil and the water. And just literally by keeping them on separate bottles and applying them one after the other, we have avoided emulsifiers, preservatives, and a lot of those chemicals. Forgetting about the skin conditions, is there a, a, what's the best oil for the skin? So it depends. For the face, I really love pomegranate seed oil. Um, it's wonderful for anti-aging, um, for helping to prevent wrinkles. Um, it's got elagic acid and some special punistic acid, some special things that we only get from pomegranate seeds. And, you know, the pomegranate plant is just so wonderful all around. So I love that for the face. It's pretty pricey. So it's hard to imagine using that as like a full body moisturizer. Besides that, are there other oils for the face? Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and for acne, I like grapeseed oil because it tends not to cause breakouts for the body. Um, I really, I like, I mean, I like blends for everything, but, um, you can use straight oil. So what well, the cheapest thing to do is probably go to like your local market and buy a high quality organic cold press, like avocado oil. You can just keep that in your bathroom and use that as a body moisturizer. And it's cheap. I don't like olive oil. It's high in oleic acid. And a lot of people have problems with oleic acid. So I don't actually like products. heavy. It's hard to find organic avocado oil. 
It's not, it's not. If you go to Whole Foods or like here in, you know, LA, we've got fancy places like Erewhon, you can find it. But I also like blends. So I like body butters, which is oils mixed with like a shea butter or cocoa butter. And that makes it a little bit thicker. So that's good in like the winter, let's say, where we might need a little more um, hydration to sit on the skin. But um, really just all the oils and butters, they're, they're great for your skin. Just be careful with what you put on the face. I don't put coconut oil on the face. It's comedogenic and can pretty easily cause breakouts. But if you stick with grapeseed or pomegranate on the face, you usually um, doesn't cause any sort of breakouts or anything, but yeah, just anything, grab your avocado oil and okay. lather up. <laughs> One more obscure comment. Uh, I noticed in your webinar, you discussed the negative effects of polyamines. And um, I just recently, uh, went down a wormhole. I, I guess there's a number of articles. One of the polyamines is called spermidine. And I guess there's some interesting anti-aging benefits of spermidine. I've seen, I've seen those new things out. Um, I mean, I think the, the problem with polyamines, so polyamines are naturally occurring substances. They do contribute to growth. We tightly regulate them. But what can happen, particularly in psoriatic patients, is when we eat meat, and we don't digest the meat properly, it goes into the large intestine and it gets fermented by more pathogenic bacteria there that create these polyamines like putrescine and cadaverine, which as the names indicate, oh, it's putrid, it's a cadaver. Yes, these are the things that create a stench in rotting meat and corpses. So I think we already know that like having high amounts of those, probably not something we want in a living body. There are other polyamines like spermidine and spermididine, um, which we're learning about, but these high levels of like putrescine and cadaverine and, and the polyamines are found in the plaques of psoriatic patients and in their blood and urine. And when we reduce the levels of these polyamines in psoriatic patients, we see improvements. So I, I personally would not take a spermidine supplements. I don't want high levels of those. I will wait and see what the research says about it. But um, so far for the research I've done, we really don't want to be pushing high levels of polyamine. So I wouldn't personally do it. Interesting. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. This has been a fascinating discussion. And uh, how can uh, listeners and viewers get a hold of you, find out about your programs? Yeah. So uh, my clinic is a center for integrative dermatology. I practice and see patients in California, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, my website is integrativedermatologycenter.com. I also do consults for healthcare practitioners, uh, you know, nationwide. Um, so if you need help on a tough patient, I can help you out. Um, I've also got a series. So for your healthcare practitioner listeners, uh, they might be interested in a series of um, 20 uh, CE courses and their AMA. Um, and so uh, their life, their CE accredited for both MDs and NDs. And I'm not sure what other ones, but there's 20 courses. They're all free. You can earn up to 10 CE credits and it's at learnskin.com. It's the naturopathic and integrative dermatology series. And um, I've written some of the courses and I've worked with um, thought leaders on, some, on many of the other courses. And it's all the things I'm talking about here. So you can find a course on like gut health, um, and skin health. You can find a course on skin pH and skin disease. Uh, we have specific courses on diseases. So like there's the naturopathic approach to acne or naturopathic approach to psoriasis. And we've really tried to pull together all this information because there's so much information out there, but it, the, the, the dots have not been connected well either in functional medicine or naturopathic medicine. We, we don't have a lot of uh, continuing ed or modules on dermatology, but when you do the research, it's all there, you pull it together clinically, um, you will get results. And so, yeah, if, if anybody's interested in learning more, it's free, head on over to Learn Skin and look for the naturopathic and integrative dermatology series. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Thanks so much for having me, Ben.